Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Gino got excited. Uh, But it's good to get excited in the house of God. Whenever I come to church, whether it's to preach or just sit in the back pew, I come with expectation. I come with the expectation of feeling the power of God, of seeing the presence of God. And I can stand here tonight, and it would be very easy for me to regale you with stories of my childhood, to tell you of the things I've seen, to speak to you of miracles and prophecies, but I'm one of those selfish guys that wants to see these things today. For too long, we've been living and feeding ourselves with stories. We've been living in nostalgia of other people's experiences when we can have these experiences ourselves today. We need the power of God. I came into the sanctuary tonight fully intent on preaching Matthew 24. It's one of the greatest prophecies in the Word of God and one that is most overlooked by the church because even though it was spoken by Christ, it really contradicts the flesh. And as I sat there and I began going through it, God stopped me after the fifth verse. And He says, just preach these verses. And so go with me to Matthew chapter 24. And no, I will not preach the entire chapter. Because I am one of those people that believes if God leads, man should follow. Because whether we're behind God or ahead of God, we're still not in God's will. See, oftentimes man likes to help God out. And God points us in a certain direction, but he never tells us to move. He just says, turn east. And so we think... Well, God told me to turn east. I'm going to try to help him out, and I'm going to start to walk. And eventually, we're walking, and we're walking, and we hear the voice of God, and God says, where'd you go? And we say, Lord, you told me to go east. He said, no, I told you to turn east. See, whether we're ahead of God or behind him, we're still not in God's will. Matthew 24 is a powerful chapter, but these are the only verses that that God said to speak on, and so I will begin to read from verse 3. Now, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Amen? The apostles thought they had an in with Christ. They hung around with him. They traveled with him. Some had suffered for him. And so they got together on the Mount of Olives and he said, Look, let us sit on a secret. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, I look at this chapter and I realize that Jesus began to speak to them. And the first thing out of Christ's mouth was, Take heed that no one deceives you. If we look at this chapter in order of importance, we realize what the key thing that Christ was trying to teach them was. It was verse 4. Take heed that no one deceives you. Because throughout the scriptures, from Paul to Luke to Peter to John, there is a common thread. The last days will be full of deception. But take heed that no one deceives you. In Timothy, in Thessalonians, in 1 Peter, in 2 Peter, in 2 John, in 3 John, throughout the gospel, there is that common thread that the enemy in the last days will attempt to deceive the children of God. All we need to do is open our eyes. And we can see the deception, not outside the house of God, but that deception has crept its way in to the house of God already. See, we look at the world and we stand on the battlements and we expect the greatest of tragedies to come from the outside. But in the last 30 or so years, the greatest setbacks that the church has suffered have been from within the church, not from outside. I hope we open our hearts tonight because this this message is of great importance in this hour. See, the greatest tool and perhaps the only tool that the enemy has at his disposal against the children of God is deception. We know that the world has nothing to offer us. And if the enemy would reveal himself to us in, in, in all of his cruelty... Because he is as a roaring lion, ready to devour. We would shy away, we would run, but the devil attempts to deceive. And the greatest deception perpetrated upon the children of God in this hour 
is that God no longer has expectation of His children. Please hear me on this. We're preaching a gospel absent of sacrifice. We're preaching a God absent of expectation. And knowing that God changes not, we know that God has expectations of His children. Go with me to Isaiah. Yeah, we're going to travel through the Bible a little bit. The Bible's cool. I, I know this is a childish term, but ever since I started reading it when I was a kid, and God began to show me, even at fragile age, that His Word is truly bottomless. You read one verse, and you get something out of it, and you read it again, and something else pops up. Isaiah chapter 5 speaks of a vineyard. It speaks of one who planted a vineyard, and he planted it on a very fruitful hill. Begin to read with me. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it, so he expected it to bring forth good grapes. But it brought forth wild grapes. Amen? How many of you know that God's expectation is justified? The Bible tells us that God did everything that He could to ensure that we bring forth good grapes. We look at this nation in this present tower and we realize that we have been planted on a very fruitful hill. Everywhere you turn, there's a book on the Bible, there's a book on doctrine, there's a book on spirituality. You can have teachings on any verse of any chapter of any book of the Bible any time you want it. We have access to all the accumulated knowledge of the last 2,000 years, and yet we're the most ignorant generation that has ever been. I know, it hurts. But see, I have children in my church in Romania that know the book of James by heart, the first three chapters of Romans by heart. And you come to some American churches and you ask them simply to name all the books of the Bible and they look at you as though you were talking about UFOs. We have access to everything. In His goodness, God has opened the storehouse of His wisdom and knowledge. And we dismiss it as though it were nothing. See, God planted us on a very fruitful hill with the expectation of us bearing good grapes. See, it's not enough to come to the house of God. I'm sure you come here every Sunday and you hear the good news of the gospel. You hear good teaching. You're on the vine. But see, my mother used to own a vineyard, and I used to go and visit it from time to time, and I saw something very interesting. There were some grapes that ripened on the vine, while others that were away from the sun remained green. It's not enough to be on the vine. We must be ripe. Please understand this. When we stand before God, we can't say, well, I showed up in church every Sunday. The question will be, what did you learn? How did you practically apply what you learned to your life? How was your heart transformed? See, it's not enough to be in the house of God. We must actively seek God out. In the summer, do this. Go to where they grow grapes and see that sometimes the vines, even when they're in the shadows, they run up to, to seek the sun. Because they realize that there is life in the sun. And absent the sun, they will wither and they will die because the season of their harvest is only a season. We talked about this this morning. Now, while you still have this season of peace, seek the sun and grow in God. Because soon the sun will be no more. Soon there will be darkness and you will not be able to grow. The Bible tells us that grace will depart from the Gentiles. I realize that we're getting into heavy doctrinal stuff, but we need to, to realize that we, we must redeem today for tomorrow doesn't belong to us. 
We must know the will of God and we must know the voice of God because deception in God's own house will only increase and multiply. The closer we get to the end of the age, the more deception will grow. And too often, many who come to the house of God hear the voice of God so rarely that they don't know to discern the voice of God. See, I'm married. I have a wife. I also have a little brother who sounds exactly like me. If anyone calls my home and he answers, people go, Mike. And if I answer, they go, Daniel. The only person that knows the difference, even if I just say hello, is my wife. See, me and my brother, we have exactly the same voice pattern. We speak exactly in the same manner. But for some reason, my wife knows when it's me. We need to know the voice of our master. The Bible says that my sheep know my voice. But if we only run across our shepherd once a year, how will we know his voice? Because, see, imitation is very close to truth. It's not truth, but it's very close. And you can only discern a counterfeit gospel by knowing the real gospel. That is the only way you will be able to resist deception. The second deception that is perpetrated in the church today is that God has lowered his standards with the times. See, the message of the hour in many of today's churches is no longer come as you are and leave transformed. The message of the hour is, come as you are, leave as you came, as long as you leave a little coin. I'm sorry, this is reality. I've been doing this since I was 12 years old. I am tired. Over half my life have, ha has been spent traveling this nation, preaching a message that so many refuse to hear. Because every time you speak of impending judgment, of God's righteousness demanding that He judge a sinful nation, People look at you and go, that's me. Ah, oh, you're just a doom and gloomer. You don't believe in the love of God. It's the love of God that has kept you this long. It's the mercy of God that has sent messengers from every corner of this earth to preach this message to this nation. Nineveh got one shot. They got one guy that really didn't want to do what he was doing. It took being swallowed by a fish to finally talk Jonah into going into Nineveh. And the thing of it was, Nineveh never even got a shot at repentance. Read the story of Jonah. He walks into the city, it's a three days walk, and he just starts going, 40 more days, you're all going to die. That was Jonah's message. God sent messengers to America with mercy. He said, if you repent, I will heal you. Jeremiah 51 says, we would have healed her. But she is not healed. What will it take to cause the church in this nation to wake up? If September 11, 2001 didn't do it, by God, what will? Open your eyes. Open your eyes and sanctify yourselves. Because the day is coming when God will no longer send warning. He will send judgment. I know some of you are looking at me as though I was the strangest thing in the world right now. What's he talking about? You will see. See, I know you've had people here that have spoken the same message and perhaps you disregarded it and you will disregard mine as well. But on the day you will stand before your Creator, you will have no excuse or justification. This is why I'm here so that I can stand before my God and say, clean hands, no blood. I spoke the truth. I didn't tell them what they wanted to hear. I told them what they needed to hear. Judgment is coming. Be ready. And the king heard that a strange man was walking through Nineveh speaking this message, 40 more days and you're all going to die. And it doesn't say the king believed Jonah. It says the king believed the voice of the Lord. It took one wise man to say, let us repent in sackcloth and ash. Perhaps God will relent. 
Although they were never given the option of repentance, one wise king said, perhaps we will change the heart of God. Perhaps we will change the mind of God. Let us repent. And judgment was averted for a hundred years. God still judged Nineveh. But it was a hundred years later, after every single person that lived during that time in that generation that repented had already gone. Judgment has been spoken against this nation. But this nation is not as wise as Nineveh to repent in sackcloth and ash. We're seeing the wolves howling. We're seeing the darkness gathering and, and, and approaching. And As long as we have enough for the building fund, and as long as our worldly needs are taken care of, it's okay. It's not. The day is coming when you will need to trust God again. The third deception that is being perpetrated upon the house of God today, that is perhaps worse than any other, is that there are many paths, but one destination. And this isn't being preached by Buddhists or Hindus. This deception is not being perpetrated by New Agers or Islamists. It's the pinnacle of Christendom in America that is sitting on national television and going, well, there are many paths to God. What has become of this word in this country? Have we lost all reverence for the word of God? Have we lost all respect? Do we simply take it and chuck it out the window? And make up our own doctrine as, as we go along. The man leading the biggest congregation in this nation stood on national television and said, I can't say Jesus is the only way. Oh yeah, Christian nation. Because that's the excuse we use for God not saying, oh, we're a Christian nation. Are we Really? Really? Can you still stand there with, 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 with a serious look on your face and say, we're a Christian nation? There is only one way. And the way is Jesus. It's as simple as that. And I should have heard a lot of amens. Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life and no man comes to the Father but by me. If pastors can't get their head around that one, they shouldn't be pastors in the first place. But see, the world flocks to deception. And that's why they have congregations of 10,000, 15,000, 16,000. We, we, we've taken quantity and sacrificed quality rather than sacrifice quantity for the sake of quality. See, God's not looking for quantity Christians. He's looking for quality Christians. See, Gideon had a giant army ready to do battle. And God looks down and he says, ah, just too many. You know, it may be that at some point after I give you the victory, you're going to say it was us that did it. So out of what, 21,000... 300 men, but men who were faithful. It took one king to change the course of a nation. It took an army of 300 to defeat the Philistines. It doesn't take great swelling numbers to change the world. Twelve guys did it. Do you remember? Twelve men, and not, not seminary graduates, and not doctors of theology. Among the twelve, there was Luke and Paul that were somewhat intelligent. Other than that, they were simple fishermen. And yet, here's Peter, the fisherman standing before Annas and Caiaphas and all the leadership of that era. All the religious heads of his time. 
And he begins to speak words not of a fisherman, but of a philosopher. He begins to speak with such passion and eloquence. He begins to speak so high above his intellect level that those hearing him speak look upon him and say, there's only one explanation. We know Peter. He fishes. He knows how much a pound of fish is. He shouldn't know these things. And so the only explanation for Peter's wisdom is that he has been with Jesus. Read the book of Acts. It's, it's, it's really cool. I use that word again. They realized that Peter had been with Jesus, and that was the only explanation for his wisdom. Why is it that we so readily act as though we're children of a lesser God? You heard me. Why is it that we walk around with our heads bowed? Why is it that we walk around in, in fear of any sort of confrontation? We act as though we're children of a lesser God while the world flaunts its sin. We will not stand for the name Jesus. At one point, Jesus said, Blessed is he who is not ashamed of me. And for the longest time, I couldn't understand that. How could someone be ashamed of Christ? One who has reached that, that level of understanding, who had seen the love, who had realized that Christ died on the cross. But now, in our modern age, we see that men are ashamed of their Savior. They don't want to carry the stigma of being a fundamentalist Christian. See, the world is praising us for intellectual and theological flexibility. But that's another way of saying we're very happy that you're willing to compromise. See, there's enough compromisers in the world. Where are those that will stand? Where are those that will fight? Where are those that will understand and realize they serve an awesome God? A mighty God. A God that is able to work in them and through them so that men would look and say, We know Him! These things shouldn't be coming out of His mouth. We know Him. He used to stutter. Couldn't even read very well. What's he doing up there? Preaching. And he's doing it in such a way that it's piercing the hearts of men. We know him. And we realize it's not him. See, that's the greatest thing to me. When you see someone that couldn't possibly be doing it. When you see that they're not smart enough to be able to stand and, and give a sermon that pierces the heart. You know that it's God through them. That's when you can say, glory to God. See, I've heard enough polished sermons in my time. I could give you a polished sermon. Step one, step two, step three, finale. I could probably even make you cry. But I just want to wake you up. See, I don't care about making you cry, about making you shed tears. That's between you and God in your prayer closet. I care about waking you up to the reality that time is short. And that today is the day of sanctification. The fourth deception in the house of God is that we can disregard the word of God and that we can pick and choose the scriptures that suit us. See, I've run across enough American evangelists in my time to realize that if the only scripture in the entire Bible was the widow of Zarephath, they would be content. It seems that every other sermon has to do with the widow of Zarephath. She made the pancake for the man of God first. And you know what that means. Before you pay your mortgage, before you pay your car payment, before you pay your insurance, you've got to give to the man of God first. 
every television program, every radio program, hinges around that one scripture. And yet the Bible tells us the entirety of the Bible was inspired divinely by God himself. You can't pick and choose the scripture you like. You can't pick one verse out of Psalms that says God wants to prosper you and disregard the entire New Testament where it says you need to die to self. You can't pick one verse that says there is freedom in the Spirit and disregard the fact that God said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. In order to grow in God, you need to have balance and receive the entirety of God's Word. Because there's too many stunted Christians. We only hold the scripture that we like and we push away those that we don't. It is the word of God in its entirety. Even those scriptures that the flesh rebels against, it's still the word of God. It's still the will of God. And we do the same thing with the topic of the end times. Throughout all of Scripture, there is one verse that if you read it in the right translation and omit a couple words before and after the verse, it kind of hints at the fact that we're not going to be here for any trials. And so those that are unwilling to sacrifice the flesh for the greater things of God cling to that verse until their nails bleed. But we go back to the idea of Matthew chapter 24, and after Jesus said, Beware that no one deceives you, he begins to speak of the things that will be precursors to his return, precursors to to, to his coming and the signs of the end of the age. And he says, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. See, the reason that I preach against deception is because deception works. Jesus said it would. If Jesus said, they will come in my name saying I am the Christ and won't deceive anyone because they'll know it's not me, then I wouldn't be preaching this. The issue and the fact of the matter is that deception deceives. And it doesn't deceive few, it deceives many. Because although we know that the path is narrow and few are those that find it, we hear one voice and then another and then another saying, Well, brother, I found a shortcut. We bought bulldozers and we widened the path. And you hear so many of them spewing the same thing that you finally go, Well, maybe he's right. Eternal. Look up the Word. That's what the Word of God is. The Word of God is eternal. It does not change. God does not change. He, as His Word, is eternal. And once God established in His Word that the path is narrow, then it will remain narrow until He returns. I know, I know, but, but brother so-and-so is on TV and you know he's got the $50,000 pinky ring and, and he says that he knows a secret the Lord revealed to him. What did the Lord reveal to him? Anything that's outside of this book, it's not the Lord revealing it. It's the devil. I'm sorry. Anything that comes out of anyone's mouth that is preceded by, thus says the Lord, should have one purpose, to lead you closer to Christ. Whenever someone says, thus says the Lord, and then attempts to draw you further away from Christ, know that it's the Lord of this age. Open your ears. Many will be deceived because the flesh is a wicked thing. And it just sits there and waiting, just waiting for you to to, to stop being watchful, to stop having discernment. If the church needs anything today, it's discernment. One of the gifts. If we have discernment, we know what is of God and what isn't. 
See, any prophecy that comes forth today will serve to draw you closer to God. It will warn you of things to come so that you know the time is short and you need to draw closer to God. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. It seems that today's church overreacts more than the world does sometimes. We, we can be honest with each other. We've known each other a full day now. We can be honest with each other. It would seem the world doesn't react and doesn't panic as much as the church does. And yet Jesus says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. I've already told you these things beforehand. You shouldn't be scared. You shouldn't be concerned. Your heart shouldn't be troubled. Because worse is yet to come. And you know that it should because it's in the Word. But see, if you didn't pay close attention to that first verse, take heed that no one deceives you, then you will not believe the rest of this chapter even though they came out of Christ's mouth. I hope you get this. Because there are some people who I've had discussions for eight, ten hours on this chapter alone. And they hold to their position and I hold to the gospel's position. But brother, this isn't for us. Who is it for? Brother, who is the word of God written for? children of God, the body of Christ. Now, let's presuppose that tomorrow morning, we're all going to sprout wings and fly away and, and, and going to be in heaven forever. Why would Jesus waste his breath and tell us of all these things that are to come? It's a logical question. God is a God of reason. See, you, you think on a topic logically, and it makes sense. Although God supersedes reason, He is also a God of reason. God forewarns you of what is to come, because you will be here to see these things with your eyes. And the last thing God wants His children to be is ignorant of the times that are coming. See, there will be many people that will flee the house of God when they see these things approaching. Because they were never taught that they may have to suffer for the cause of Christ. They were preached and they received a good time gospel. And good time gospel can only apply in good times. See, that's the tragedy of the good time gospel. It sounds great. Jesus wants you to be rich and healthy and wealthy and have boats and cars and airplanes. You can buy Bob Tilton's two-volume power packed how to get rich and have everything you ever wanted and, and cashing in. Scripturally. But these things can only apply when your faith isn't tested. When you don't have to stand for the things that you believe in. When you can go along with the flow and, and simply just, just blend in one of the crowd. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. We're already seeing wars and rumors of wars. I pray you are not troubled. Do not react as the world reacts, because the world looks to us. And they want to see if we have the peace of Christ. The peace and the joy that surpass human understanding. See, we've twisted the word of God and, and, and we're preaching this gospel that in order to have the peace of God, you must have stuff. You will have joy because of your circumstances. But the book teaches us that we have peace and we have joy in spite of our circumstances, not because of them. That's when you know it is from God. When someone runs into you on the street and they see you smiling and they know your condition, they know that you ride a bike to work, they know that you rent an apartment, they know that you have to change of clothes and that they have everything materially possible and they look at you and they don't understand. And the question begins to 
tickle their tongue. Tell me, how is it possible that I have more money than you, that I own a house, and you rent an apartment, that I have a car, you ride a bike, you're uglier than I am. Why are you happier than me? See, the world will begin to wonder why you could be happier than them when they have more stuff than you do. Because happiness is not hinged to the things of this earth. Happiness is anchored in Christ. And if you have Christ, you have everything in abundance. And if you don't have Christ, you can have everything of this earth and you will be a miserable wretch. I know people that couldn't count all their money, that were so miserable that they took their own lives because they didn't have the peace of Christ in their heart. Know where your true treasure lies. Know what is truly worthwhile in your life and pursue it. God likes being pursued. Yes, He will come to you, but He expects you to go to Him too. It's enough of having this, this one-sided relationship. Lord, I'm, I'm comfortable here. I'm waiting for you to come to me. If God is truly precious to you, then you will pursue Him just as readily as He pursues you. Let's continue with this, because I, I, I'm only going to read a couple more verses, but it's good. It's the Word of God. And if we receive it, we will know what is coming and be able to prepare spiritually for what is coming. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Amen? Anyone see any hint of our departure yet? And yet there's Christians standing up on hilltops dressed in white robes, flapping their arms. I've heard pastors with my own ears saying, we should have been gone already. That terrifies me. That terrifies me. Because if a pastor says, we should have been gone already, then his entire congregation isn't prepared. Consider this. Consider the next two verses and realize why the offense to see, Christ, 2,000 years ago, pegged it. And it was right on the money. I mean, bullseye after bullseye. Let's read this. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. When is then? Before his return. Before the end of the age. The then for our generation has not yet come. Prepare yourselves. They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for what? For my name's sake. See, you can run into anyone on the street, and you could talk to them about an abstract God, a deity. You could talk to them of a supreme being, a creation force. But when you start to mention the name Jesus, you will know where that person stands in an instant. Walk into any room and start to talk about Allah, about God, about deities, about the goddess. But mention the name Jesus and you will polarize the entire place. There is power in the name Jesus. And the enemy hates and fears the name Jesus. And Jesus said, you will be hated for my name's sake. For a 2,000 year old prophecy, he was, he was pretty close, wasn't he? See, there is a war going on in the supposedly Christian nation against the name of Jesus. If you don't believe it, open your eyes. If you don't believe it, look around you. See, and right now, we're all being herded into this ecumenical mindset. Fame God, different names. The deception. The deception. 
many paths, same destination. And this is being propagated by pastors and preachers. They're in on it. They're leading people to hell, and they have blood on their hands, and all they can do is sit there and smile their white teeth smile. And count the money at the end of the broadcast. Because they've been given over. Because the love of money has rooted itself so deeply into their heart that they no longer care that they're leading men to destruction. Welcome to 2006, American Christianity. And so I tell you this day, if you're in a place where you're being taught truth, appreciate it. You don't know how rare an opportunity it is. If you are being taught the meat of God's word, go home and get on your knees and say, Lord, thank you for the person that's teaching me. And don't do it once and don't do it twice. Do it every single day of your life. Because deception abounds even in God's own house. And the sheep are flirting with the wolves. And the shepherds are just trying to keep them apart. And I've met so many shepherds that have grown so weary and that have grown so tired, they say, I'm just going to leave them to their own desires. See, it's no longer the wolves hunting the sheep anymore. It's the sheep flirting with the wolves. Because the wolves are promising you a wider path. They're promising you a cheap salvation. They're promising you death. Verse 10. And then many will be offended. Will betray one another and will hate one another. Why? That's the million dollar question right there. If you can answer me that question, you will know what the end times are all about. Why will so many be offended? Because as so many pastors have said, they expected to be out of here by then. Do you realize that, that there will be temples? Churches that could seat thousands that will be nothing more than homes for rats and birds in this country? Places you will not hear the name of Jesus spoken, but simply the wind blowing through the empty pews? Because their entire doctrine was based on a lie. They had no foundation. And when they see persecution, and when they see that the world will hate them for Christ's name's sake, this isn't what I signed up for. I just wanted a new house. I just wanted a better paying job. What are you talking about? persecution and suffering. See, for some Christians, this will be the greatest time in the history of Christianity. The prophets and the apostles would envy you knowing the time that you live in. And for some, it will be a time of ultimate regret of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because having heard the truth, they dismissed it and received the lie. We turn our back on conviction and on the word of God and receive and accept the opinions of men. Brother, you do so at your own peril. I know this message tonight was not an easy message to hear by any means, but if you don't think it was easy to hear, believe me, it wasn't easy to give. But it's a message that I had to speak because this is where God led me tonight. Then many false prophets will rise up and do what? Deceive many again. See, deception does not end until Christ returns and puts an end to it. This is why you need to know where you stand in God. You need to know where you are rooted, where your foundation is. You need to be in the presence of your master so often and know his voice so well 
that you pick up on the counterfeit right away. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. The house of God has become a place without boundaries in this country. Sin is relative. Yet the Bible says what is sin and what is not. Well, brother, you understand God your way and I'll understand God my way. No, I'm sorry. God is to be understood in the light of the gospel and any other way but that is deception. But because lawlessness will abound in the house of God, the love of many will grow cold. Because they never had to surrender their entire hearts. They never had to crucify the flesh. They never had to die to the flesh. They never experienced the burning of a baptism by fire. Because the whole point of the baptism by fire is to purify. That's what fire does. Every time God puts you in the furnace of affliction, every time God puts you in the fire, it's to bring you out more pure than He put you in. For all the impurities to melt away so that it becomes something even more precious in His eyes. But come Wednesday and you'll hear whoever it is giving that lesson because I'm just rambling. And I'm going to end with verse 13 because this is the promise to the true believer. This is the promise to the true child of God. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. It's in the book. I realize the Baptist brothers are very excited about the idea that all you have to do is raise your hand once and that's it. You're off to heaven camp. But the book tells us repeatedly that he who endures to the end shall be saved. See, it's not someone who begins a race that receives the crown. It's someone who finishes the race. And while they're running, they let nothing distract them. Have you seen these racers? They've got family on the side lanes. They've got people with, like, water cups. They're focused, man. And they're focused on one ultimate thing to cross the finish line. Let that be your focus. See Christ and the cross before you and let nothing distract you. Like Paul said, run the race faithfully that you may receive the crown of life. Because everyone can begin a race. Not everyone finishes it. See, there is truth in that statement. And for some, it's a painful truth. Because so often we go back to the starting line over and over again just because we like to hear the gun go off. We run a little ways and we get tired and we go, all right, next week I'll start the race all over again. Brother, God is not mocked. Whoever this is for, let it sink in because it is the last time you will hear this. God is not mocked. You cannot play with God and expect to get away with it. If you commit, commit. If not, don't bring shame to the house of God by living in hypocrisy. The time has come to choose. The time has come to adopt an either-or mentality. Either with God or against Him. Because there is no third choice. There is no other option either with God or against Him. And if you stand at the crossroads of indecision long enough, God will choose for you. Today, we must choose. Do we stand with God or are we against Him? Because these are the only options that we have left. Soon you will see things unfolding in this world that will baffle your mind. Know that the Word of God spoke of them thousands of years ago. Know that faithful men were sent to this nation and spoke this message and still speak this message.
I realize that the following statement will be painful for some. I do not believe that America will repent. I do not believe we are another Nineveh. We've crossed the threshold of judgment. But thankfully, our relationship with God is not a collective issue. It's an individual concern. It's time to individually cling to our God. And when we come together in fellowship, simply be strengthened by our brothers and our sisters. It's time to know the truth on which we stand because our faith will be tested. And if you don't know what you believe in, you won't know what you're standing for. It's time to arise. It's time to be what God has always expected his children to be. Because whether we choose not to do a thing or we do a thing half-heartedly, God still does not receive it as a well-pleasing sacrifice. Serve God with all of your heart, not because he can give you stuff, but because he's already given you his son. And that is the greatest treasure anyone can ever receive. Thank you for having us here. If I've brought offense to anyone, please complain to the author of the book. <laughs> May God bless you and keep you. May you be vigilant in this hour. And may you be living testimonies of the grace and power of God. Amen.